So when you um, get your shell code to execute for this exercise, this is probably the hardest exercise in the class. Once you throw up your hands and say, compliment it on And unless you say that, I won't acknowledge you. I'll just say, nope, no one's got it yet, I guess. <laughs> And the uh, one nice thing is that even though this is a dynamic memory, the allocations are predictable. So if you do an allocation of 128 bytes, something like that, and put your shellcode in that, um, the address for that heap chunk will pretty much always be the same because the heap allocator is deterministic uh, and the memory addresses it chooses, basically. And that's true with many uh, memory allocators. And that fact is widely abused by many like browser exploits and stuff like that. that uh, these memory allocators are just deterministic, and you can guess where the memory is located or where it's going to be located uh, when you allocate things. And when you can't guess, you do a heap spray, fill up the whole contents of the heap with stuff. So that way you don't have to guess with everything that can be shelter. Uh, Corey? Yeah. Um, double question. You said that the buffer has to be large enough to contain our shellcode. Yeah. But aren't we just pointing the global object able to execute our shellcode, which exists somewhere else? Um, you should copy your shellcode onto the heap. Okay. I mean, you could technically just put your shellcode on the command line, and then it would be on some stack address, which is where your command line arguments end up. Oh, that's what we did last time. Yes, but I would suggest that you you know in your you do like a string copy from the command line to the buffer. Um, it will be easier if you just put your shell code in that heap chunk because that address will be more reliable than the addresses that exist. Oh, thanks for the command line. Okay. And that's basically just because you know that the first heap chunk will always be allocated to the address eight zero or zero eight zero four. It's deterministic. It's always going to be that address. Whereas on the command line, the addresses are going to shift around a little bit. And that's kind of frustrating for the debugs. I would probably recommend as well getting rid of like dump heap commands and stuff in your code once you um, know that you have the crash that you want to have, just because the dump heap thing might end up, uh, you know, you don't want your program to crash in dump heap. You want it to crash in the allocate. So if I was exploiting this, um, I mean the al the alloc user file I would use would be doesn't hurt. So I can recreate this from memory. Yeah, I would just use something like this. Were we supposed to use the? I mean, is the idea we're going to use the Arbright code to manipulate the global offset? No, we're because gonna... uh, the Arbright code will only manipulate its own global offset table. Okay, so okay. we need to add that some was, C code that will do that. Yeah, I mean, you'll um, you'll overwrite the go, you will modify the global offset table because that's what you will um, you'll put the address of the global offset table in that next pointer field in the right. control block. I got I got that, but. In order to, okay. So just remember that the global offset table is a per process thing. Each time you restart an application, I mean, you can change the global offset table for Arbright, and in the second the process is done executing, the uh, global offset table is the same again because it gets recreated each time you run the process, okay? And it's a per process thing. It's not like you can just change the global offset table for one program. And it should change system wide for everything else from there on. Each process is so global global offset table, and each time it runs, its global offset table gets restored and fixed. So you'll be changing the global offset table for the memory allocator as it is running. So um, here's a little push in the right direction. You know you're corrupting a control block. You know that next pointer, this next free chunk should be set equal to like the global offset table minus OXC or whatever, right? Because the offset thing is the net result of that offset calculation to be zero. 
You know that the previous free is should be set equal to um, shell code. Yeah. Making sure I'm not uh, getting the order wrong with these. It might actually be the uh, other way around. Let me on. Do it the other way, but use a different offset. You have to use yeah. minus eight. Yeah, right. So I'll verify that in a second. Um, so yeah, global offset table shell code. What about these? What are you guys ever writing these with? Available in size. Uh, available one in size one to twenty eight. Uh, just depending on what you're using. Like oh one oh one oh one. Just keep the nulls away. Yeah, because you can't just write the one because then you'll have null characters on the table of it, and the string copy will stop when it's a null character. You also can't make this too big. You can't make size equal to OX FF, 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 FF. Why is that? Because then it'll be treated as a negative number, is the way that number, sign numbers work. So OX, so available has to be non zero, all right? That's pretty easy to do. It has to be non zero and not contain null characters. Size has to be greater than 128 or whatever, you know, it has to be big enough to satisfy that allocation request. But it can't be too big, otherwise it'll be treated as a negative number. So it can't be bigger than like, is it 7 FFFFF, I think it is. So what I would do is I would set available equal to OX 1111111 and then size equal to OX 11111, which is a huge number. But the allocator will still use it, and it's not treated as negative. You could use 01, 01, 01. That's fine too. Um, and then let's look at these again by looking at the uh, the allocator code. I was uh, telling you the wrong order. I don't think it would matter, but um, just to keep everyone on the same page, this is how I want you to do it. So I had told you to set next free equal to the global offset table, right? And then previous free equal to your um, your shell code. Um, let me think for a second. I told you next free global Let's see. No, you know what? You can try it that way. Go for it. I was I was about to say that instead I want you to set the um, previous free equal to the global offset table and next free equal to your shell code instead of the other way around. You control both those pointers. Since this first line here is saying previous free equals next free, it would be global offset table equals your shell code. Um, and if you had it that way, if you come down here, that would mean um, shell code equals global offset table. But that's going to happen either way, actually. Uh, so what's going to happen is that sort of nasty thing I told you was, was going to appear was that in the middle of your payload, you're going to um, get some random bytes in there. And it's because of one of these other rights. So if you check previous free, Global offset table next free equals your shell code. And down here, the address of where your shell code is located, plus some offset, equals um, the global offset table. So the bytes associated with the global offset table. So that means your shell code would have 0804 something, 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 something written in the middle of it. So what you're going to do instead, and that should happen if you choose either one, if instead you make um, Previous, you know, the other way around, that issue is still going to come back up. So what you're going to do is, instead of it pointing directly at your shell code, instead of pointing the global offset table directly at your shell code, you're going to point it at the middle of your no-op sled. And then this line right here will um, write some junk into the middle of your no-op sled. And then you'll have to figure out a way to uh, jump around that.
So the, the point is you can make um, previous free or next free the shell code or the global offset table. Either one should work because you're setting one equal to the other and the other equal to that. A equals B, B equals A kind of thing. So either one should work. You'll just have to adjust your offsets like into the structure accordingly. So yeah, keep on fighting. How's everyone's morale feel? I want to do a morale check. People feel like they want to jump off a cliff at this point. The last half of the day we'll have sort of a change of pace where I talk about some more high level stuff like uh, finding bugs and uh, exploit mitigation technologies. So if you're, um, you know, not enjoying the more technical intensive labs, there will be a break from that for a while at least. But then we'll finish strong with one last technical lab where we uh, bypass the next few stack. So Corey, um, um, I'm still just trying yes. to to understand the, the kind of the theory a little bit. I understand that we can we can overwrite the control blocks, um, and we can do it cleverly to to set the, uh, yeah. the the detour address with previous free for previous free chunk equal that, and that next free chunk we could set that to our shell code address, but we still need something in the code to actually execute and and go to um, to to uh, the the ditter's address, right? So and and how is this yeah. allocation deallocation act? It, it's not really executing code that's going to call this, is it? Yeah, it is, but it's only it's confusing because it's implicitly doing it. So the destructor will be called yeah. when the program goes to exit. So whenever the program is going to exit, then the program will execute your shell code since you uh, overwrite the destructor with um, the address of your shell code. Or if you overwrite the global offset table um, with the address of your shell code, the next time it calls like printf. Or puts, or whichever one you. Yeah, overrode, I got that, I, and I understand code. how we did those. I'm, I'm, I guess what I'm not seeing is how overwriting our control block impacts either the gots or the ditters. And any, if we, if we couldn't, we're, we're assume, okay. I guess we're assuming we didn't get access to the gots or or ditters directly like we did before. We're trying to take advantage of the allocation right. program to do that. Yes. Exactly. Yes, and so the re so we overwrite those pointers in the control block. You got that. And then when this code, this code right here that I'm showing on the screen is in the uh, the allocator is executed, we control sure. like the previous free chunk pointer yep. and the next free chunk pointer. And essentially what this line of code is doing is saying previous free chunk equals next free chunk. So in our case, global offset table. And, and, and I got that. Code. What I, I guess I don't understand is the allocator is just look, just going to look at these values to decide where it puts the new chunk, right? I mean, it's not if it sees this value, the worst thing it's going to have. It's not necessarily going to jump there and, and call what's there. It's just going to say, okay, that's where I'm going to build my new, you know. Right, and so. That's right. We're not gaining control of the instruction pointer um, directly or right after we perform this. We're only corrupting some memory that will later be used to control the DIP. And so eventually, when we use this to overwrite the global offset table or the destructor, um, eventually later on in the program's execution, we'll grab control of EIP when something like a printf is called and the global offset table is referenced. Or something like that. Okay, so we're just using this as a convenient place to store our our shell code, I guess. And okay. And we're and we're also abusing it to actually change the global offset table or the uh, destructor. Okay. But okay. 
So normally, normally you can't just change a program's global velocity table when it's running. That's right. Normally that is not possible. But we are abusing the overflow and this line of code in the memory allocator to change the global offset table, which we normally cannot do. And then because we can change the global offset table, eventually that will allow us to gain control of the instruction. Okay, form. so like we've 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 written we've established the address it looks like of the global offset or uh, actually with this like we're doing it with ditters um, so we're, we're telling it where that that lo that's located in memory and we're putting we're putting a pointer to that in the control block right so yes. I guess from how yes. where in the code in the allocating code is it going to that and making change, going to that address and making changes in, in the ditters part of? Yeah. So, um, first off, I would recommend that you use the global okay. offset. Okay, we'll use global offset. Okay. Uh, both, both, both should work, but the, uh, the struct form might actually okay. be a little bit more complicated. But um, so let's assume that you've. Um, so you've, uh, you do the buffer overflow, and you've corrupted That's the right. uh, control block, right? You control the uh, the next free and the previous free uh, pointer that right. goes we got those. in the control block. Okay. Then, when this line of code executes, alloc 128, um, it will eventually we'll call Yeah, and um, that's kind of final. So just trying okay. to scroll down to the paper alloc. So eventually, <coughs> this will be executed. It's going to find that chunk yeah. of memory uh, to give back to the user, and it's going to unlink it from the free list and call this function right here, unlink chunk. Okay. And it's unlinking the chunk whose control block we have corrupted. So then, will execute this group of code right here. And essentially what this code does is yeah. So yeah. set Previous free chunk, the address of whatever points to pre whatever. Interpret previous free chunk as a pointer yeah. and set up whatever it's pointing at equal to next free chunk. So in this case, it will set global table for like printf or something equal to address of our shell code. Oh, okay. So we're we're not really we're we're. Okay, so at, we're not so we're taking that, advantage this of this point, we have corrupted this part of alloc, not really to uh, assign new memory, me I guess, but we just happen to overwrite. <sighs> okay. Yeah, we're taking advantage of it to um, arbitrarily change four bytes of memory in the process address space. And then once you this happens, um, even though alloc user dot c doesn't call printf, the memory allocator is calling printf a lot. Um, like whenever it does one of these alloc logs, it's calling printf. So the next time one of those happens, then our shell code will be executed because we've overridden that global offset table with the address of our shell code. Has anyone got it yet? I don't know. What is that? I'm supposed to say again. 
Papa Legba, you're my call. <laughs> Papa Legba, you're my call. Yeah, so you got your shelf executed? Yep. Okay, cool. So um, did you have to do the relative jumps to get past the bad bites? Yes. Okay. Because actually sometimes um, the bites will assemble into crappy x86 bytes, but not any bytes that will crash the process. So it'll just be like add AX 3000, you know, floating point divide, and some other weird x86 instructions, and the processor will just say, okay, whatever, and I'll just keep on trucking. And other times it'll do something bad, like divide by zero, try to dereference at that address, and it will crash. So it's actually good that you had to uh, do that and then do a relative jump test. It. So probably what we're going to do, guys, is um, keep doing this up until lunch, which I will say is at noon, and then just take a one-hour lunch. So if you've already got it, like Josh, um, you can feel free to go elsewhere and come back at 1 o'clock, or if you want, I can try to find some more fun things for you to try to battle with. Are there any heat allocators, not your toy one, but real ones, that do anything at that metadata level to try to check, like yeah. a COC checksum yeah. or something? Yeah, they've started doing that. Um, so, like, a lot of them have safe unlinking now, is what they call, where they will, and this has only happened pretty recently, well, we'll check, we'll sanity check the previous and next pointers before they try to dereference them and use them. Um, however, what you will find, which is kind of weird, is that a lot of applications out there implement their own allocator, like on top of the normal system allocator, for whatever reason. It's like uh, every programmer wants to write his own memory allocator. And um, if they're doing their own custom allocator, this kind of stuff is still on the table. And there's uh, still other allocators that you know, are vulnerable to this type of thing. And in general, with heap overflows, the techniques are always kind of changing and evolving a lot more than the stack overflows. So this is sort of a prototypical technique that's been around for a while and it's starting to be mitigated. But um, understanding how the heap works and being you know, able to draw heap diagrams and understand what your corruption is doing to the heap, you know, eventually if you understand that really well, you can still find some kind of crazy way to get the tree core by numbers. But yeah, it's, it's always changing because the allocators are always changing and becoming more optimized or more secure or this or that. And then, you know, some programmer at another company, they'll write their own memory allocator framework on top of the system one. And the system one does safe and sanity checks, but the custom one does not. And so you can use the custom one and stuff like that. So like it's healthy. I wouldn't name names, but you'd be surprised how many companies do that. It, it's really kind of surprising. It's one of those things like crypto where you really shouldn't try to do it yourself because it's really hard to get right, but everyone tries to do it anyway for whatever reason. And I can only guess it's because the programmer's like, well, you know what? I know my program better than the, the Windows programmers do since I programmed it, so I can program the allocator to be more efficient for my type of program since I know and my program is only going to use 128 byte chunks yeah. so I can optimize it for that size of allocation or something like that. You know, kind of open up a kind of worm and try to implement something like that. Well, it's not nice. Yeah, it's and then with something like um, use after free, you're not even corrupting any chunk meta information. Yeah. You're just abusing the, uh, the patterns of the memory allocator the second to uh, gain control of the IP, basically. And I'll, I'll try to talk about that a little bit more for lunch as well. Then you have memory allocators like the OpenBSD memory allocator or ones that will be super secure. And they store basically all this meta information out of band uh, with the, the actual heap. So this is all stored off to the side in its own kind of memory pool. And that way, you know, uh, buffer overflow won't corrupt that meta information that the heap allocator is using. But there's a cost with that, and that is more wasteful of memory space since you're having to kind of keep this whole other pool of memory just for the meta information instead of storing it in line. But when you have an opportunity to go open DSD, you're willing to make that trade off as a security for performance versus security. So, yeah. 
what you're doing, it's just, it doesn't matter if you do it either way. So you're doing like previous chunk equals global offset table or something like that. And the next free chunk equals shell code. But then look at this next line. Yeah, uh, yeah. This basically does shell code equals global offset table. So in your knob sled, it's writing in the bytes associated with the address of that global offset table. And it's trying to interpret those as x86 instructions. And you know, some people got lucky and those x86 instructions <coughs> turned into something that would not crash the process, just turned into some arithmetic yeah, instructions or something. In your case, Either there were bad instructions that the processor couldn't even handle, or it was trying to dereference a memory address, which is bad, or something like that, and it just crashed the process before it even gets to your shell code. Okay, but what, um, why do they get inserted at those places in memory? Is that who memory is dedicated for that? Um, right. So, global offset table equals your shell code, <coughs> but then your shell code plus. Um, Previous read. So your shell code address, your whatever address you put up here, your shell code, which is probably in the middle of your no off sled, right? Some address in the middle of your no off sled. That address plus. Oh, your so it is, but it's that C. second line that's adding those. Okay. Yes, plus, so you, that address plus C, so you can't just jump around it. Whatever address you put here, that address plus C is going to get those bad bytes. Okay, so I could try to eliminate that by. Manipulating that second line and making sure it um, points to something valid or. Something. But you can't get around it. You just have to deal with it because no matter what you put, it's like A equals B, B equals A. There's nothing. Oh, yeah. like that. The way you get around that is you just have to um, pack in that jump into your no op sled so that you hit the jump and jump over all the tasks. So you actually edit it in assembler. Um, you put it in your payload in the notebooks. Right. Um, so you just actually put the whatever the hexadecimal bytecode for jump yes. is. Yes. Yeah. So you have to figure out what the hexadecimal bytecode is for jump, some one byte offset, and then figure out how many bytes you need to jump. Thanks. So we uh, we were fumbling around, or I was fumbling around for a while trying to get that to work in in the assembly. Yeah. Source. Yeah. And never did. So. So. <laughs> I heard you say something. Just hard coded. So. When did that? But I'm not sure why it wasn't working. According to that, I was looking at the. Oh, so you were actually were trying to put in your shell code source? Yeah, in the manual it said you can do jump all caps short and then an immediate value <laughs> yeah, less than 128. Yes. Yeah, but um, if you just put it in your shell code, then um, you're pointing the global offset table at your no off sled, right? Yes. Basically, whatever you set the global offset table to, that address is plus Z plus C of the next to the offset. Yeah. It's set to uh, those bad bytes. Right. Bad bytes. So you have to um, figure out where the bad bytes are ending up, and then you pack in that jump right before it. Yep. And uh, if you can't adjust, you can't say, well, I'm just going to move it a little bit forward to get past the bad bytes, because no matter where you move it, Wherever you move it to, plus some offset, is going to get bad bytes. Yeah, I mean, eight bytes and twelve bytes into it are both going to get. Yes. Forever. So you want to just point it in the middle of your no-op slide. Because it's okay if your no-op slide is jacked up, because they don't have to execute the yeah. your shell. And, uh, so you, if you were to point this right at your shell code, it would jack up the middle of your shell code and there's nothing you need to recover from right. that because your shell code would be bad. So you point it to the middle of your no-ops because your no-ops can get clobbered, it doesn't matter. And then you just put in that, uh, you know, in your no-ops, in your payload file, just change it to the OX90s to like shell 30 bytes. Yeah. And the, what I tried to do before that, that's what I have now, what I tried to do before that was modifying the assembly source yeah. and putting in a series of no ops okay. and a jump before it. You could do that. To a label after. I thought, I think, but for some reason I couldn't get it to. It wouldn't compile? No, I kept saying that the, the jump was out of range or something. Um, so you could really try to get to a label and find a jump like in a memory box. I tried both. And it didn't work? No, I, I didn't want to. Might have been you had too many no ops and it was. Uh, not liking to jump short for the distance you were trying to jump. Maybe. I don't know. 
<laughs> anyway. Yeah, that's, um, I haven't tried putting in the actual assembly file like here, but that should be valid. Um, so yeah, I'm not sure why I would do that. Okay. But yeah, the correct thing is just to figure out what the, what the opcode is from the jump short. I think it was like EV or EH or something like that. And then like yeah, yeah, yeah. 30 bytes. Yeah, it's uh, EB and then yeah, one light off. Yeah. One thing, I don't know if anybody else stumbled on this, but I did for a little bit. There's a build.sh script yeah. in the alloc user directory, yeah. but it doesn't have the dash G option for GCC, so it didn't have debug options. There you go. That was in the debugger, which I, I don't know GDB that well, and I was stumbling around, like, why isn't it printing anything? Why can't I list anything? That's why. Yeah, so um, it might help you out a little bit if you had a dash G and yeah. a build script. So, so figure out what the bytecode for jump. I found out that is the best way to just do run a program and reverse engineer. So this I'm is what I would do. I'm trying to have a jump to an address and there's no consistency. Means uh, just jump uh, one byte for it. You know, it makes it like a. You can only jump like 255 bytes ahead. Uh -huh. Otherwise, you'll get a bunch of null bytes. Okay. And
this point I've got 128 bytes, so I'm going to consume my, uh, my first chunk. After this, I've reached the point of no return, and I'll be writing the uh, control block for the um, that second chunk that is free. So, let's see what I want to change these to. All right, so after I've uh, overridden that first 128 bytes, I need to figure out what I'm going to set that control block to. So I'm just going to draw a little bit of diagram here. So available, this has to be not zero. I'm just going to make it equal to ox11111111. Size has to be greater than 128, but not so big that it's negative. So I'm just going to make that. Uh, I'll actually make it two, 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 two. That way I can just you know check my alignment, make sure everything is ending up uh, the way it's supposed to. Uh, next screen, I'll set this equal to um, global offset table. You guys were using next screen as your global offset table, right? Or using previous screen? Either one should work. Next. 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 Okay, so you're using next <coughs> global offset table. Okay. So I'll set this equal to some global offset table. Um, which was the one that was causing crashes? Was it printf or puts? Printf. Printf was causing crashes? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Works fine. Yeah, it works fine. Just depends. Yeah. Oh, really? <laughs> who, got a, who, had, who got a crash and had to deal with do the jump eight thing? And did you, which did you use? Printf. Printf. Okay, we'll use printf and see what happens then. So, got print. F minus, um, what do I need to subtract by in this case? Is it C? So like C. <laughs> well, like C, since it's the uh, next free, previous free, 0, 4, 8, C. Previous free equals an obsolete. Okay, so let's get to work on it. doing this. Alrighty, so let's add this into our payload. There we go. That represents having overridden the um, the size and the available field for the next for that chunk we're corrupting. Uh, next comes the uh, the next. Free pointer, need to figure out what's the address there. Kind of looks like um, C58. The, uh, the printf global offset table minus 12 for OXC. Okay, and I'm uh, not really sure where my shell code is at this point, so I'm just going to put in a placeholder value and go find it. So. Okay, so there's my payload file. The last one is the dummy placeholder value now until I know what the address of my shell code is. So let's fire up the program with the payload. Set a breakpoint for after screen copy because I know that this is where my uh, payload is entering into the heap. That way I can scan the heap for where my shell code and my new ops are located. Okay. 
Now, since I'm um, just going to cheat a little bit and look at my allocator output, got to kind of know where the address is associated with the key bar. So your addresses are probably the same. 804A000 My knob should be somewhere in that vicinity. So let's go take a look. So, yep, looks like um, this address will suit me just fine, um, 804A030. I'm avoiding 20 since 20 comes out as a space and asks you to uh, cause problems for my payload. 30 should be a perfectly safe character. All of these characters look pretty safe. A030, um, 04, 08, all the way. So I'll use this as uh, what I set the global offset table to. Should be ready. Let's see what happens. Hopefully, I'll get a crash actually, so I can uh, try to debug that. Just in case, I'll go ahead and set myself up to receive core dumps from any processes that crash. So let's try to figure out what happened. Of course, do you, do you have to sit there and uh, do the art bytes or alter the GOT? No. no. You do not. Okay, I thought you did. No. The, uh, the art bright was just demonstrating that if you arbitrarily change four bytes of memory then, um, in a process, then you can gain control of EIP. But this is on like a per process basis. Each time you start up a process, the global offset table is restored. So, you know, you can use Arbyte to change the global offset table for Arbyte, which is what it's doing, but that doesn't affect any other process that's going to happen in the future, Arbyte or not. Okay. So, let's see what happened. 128 bytes. All right, I'm going to uh, get a piece of paper here to write down some of these addresses for me to check out the debugger so I can see what I did wrong. Can anyone spot what I did wrong at this point? Because I cannot. I do not know. So let's uh, double check all this. I'm guessing maybe I screwed up the address of the um, printf or something like that. So what I'm trying to overwrite, my global asset table entry is OX0804, C58. And that address is its uh, next previous. Should be 
4, 9, C, 4, C. Okay. What I'll do now is um, I want to verify that the global offset table is getting uh, overwritten with the values that I think they are. So I'm going to set a breakpoint for unlinked chunk towards the end here where I know that the, uh, the overwrite should have happened. Because that's when we do the uh, A equals B, B equals A kind of thing. So I'll set one for to uh, take our the, uh, my size might be screwed up here. Okay. Start from the beginning. How about that? So we uh, can try to get a crash, just to start from the beginning here, since so something is uh, not happening as I suspect, which is often the case in the uh, wonderful world of exploits. I'll just um, add some placeholder values here to the end. You said, okay, should that be 24 bytes of the uh, one one? Uh, I just decided to set um, I oh, you yeah, yeah, long, 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 long size the same. Okay, it looks like I got my size screwed up on the other one because um, these sizes are already looking different. It looks like you're stepping on the SH part of oh no, it's just going. Never mind. So this should crash. made a uh, horrendous rookie mistake and he was working on that exploit and the uh, source code he was looking at was not even recent. So, yeah, now we should see some things happen. There we go. Alright, so let's see what happened with the um, crash. Okay, so as expected, I just use those placeholder values, and um, I get a crash in unlinked chunk, mainly because uh, previous free chunk and next and next free chunk have been corrupted, so it's trying to set like uh, a a a a a a because that's what I set those values to be. Um, but I did forget to 
get the address of my shell code. So let's uh, go and find where that was. Um, or Uh, what was the address of the shell code that someone used, by the way? What are those heap addresses? Was it K04A? Is that right? 4A? 000? Yeah. 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 Okay. So, um, shell code address I'm going to use is 804A030. Is this one right here? So let's go and hex set in my payload and put those values in. Um, let's see here. This one is going to be the address of the global offset table minus four, minus OXC. So four C C four O eight. Yep. And then the address of my shell code, which I just found, 30A0 before. Okay. Now, let's see what just happened. was not executed, and I'm not really sure why at this point, so I just kind of want to see what's going on in the program. So I just set a breakpoint for the unlinked chunk thing after the override should have happened. And I want to check out what my global offset table looks like so I can uh, verify, number one, that I'm actually overwriting the global offset table, and two, that I'm overwriting it with the uh, correct values, the value of my, the address of my shell code. So, say x OX A O four nine C five eight. That's just the real address of the global offset table, not minus OX or anything like that. And yeah, there we go. So my shell code is ending up in the global offset table, so that is good. We see that this first entry in the global offset table points to a 0804 A030. Let's see if my shell code is actually ended up there. Now let's see if that even gets executed. So what we can do is set a breakpoint for OX 804A030. I'll just put it somewhere in the middle there. C for continue. And it never gets executed. So I'm suspecting that um, in my case, printf was not getting executed, maybe because I didn't have a dump heap in, or something in there. So instead, I'm going to try to replace that global offset table with uh, puts instead of printf or something like that. So let's go ahead and calculate the global offset table for puts. You guys used printf and it, and it actually did work, right? Yeah, all right, so uh, I once again made another dumb mistake and I got the um, global offset table value um, before I recompiled, so then I, I recompiled and the global offset tables changed. So I was just uh, overwriting, it looks like I was actually overwriting the GML start, which is going to do me any good. So I'll change that to 8049C78. 
um, and do the subtraction on that. Shell create address should not have changed though since these uh, heap allocations are deterministic, so I'll just go in and change the address of that global offset table entry. 0809C6C. There we go, all's off. Okay, good. This is what I wanted to see. So um, my shell code did execute. I probably hit those bad bytes, which is why I got that segmentation fault. Um, but at least I'm not making any dumb mistakes like I have been the past 10 minutes. So it's time to go in and debug what's going on here. And what we'll see is probably that it's saying EIP is equal to some heap address. And if that's, that heap address are some bad bytes, um, like you guys were seeing, maybe a jump or a dereference is somewhere bad. So look at the core file. There we go. Crash in um, the heap somewhere. Let's check out what's at those. Um, that address. Okay, here it is. So this is probably what's crashing the um, the code. You can see it's actually dereferencing, trying to dereference like EDI or DX or whatever this crazy instruction is in x86, and um, that's causing the crash. So what I need to do is put a short jump in here somewhere and jump ahead like um, you know 10 bytes or something like that. So I'm going to hack that into my payload and try to get lucky. So try, trying to eyeball where I should put the relative jump in my payload. I know that my payload starts at A010 previous prior experience, since that's the beginning of chunk one. Um, and this is at 0, 030, 0, so it looks like I'll have to go 20 hexadecimal, 32 bytes ahead in my NOAA payload, and put the relative jump somewhere in there. And as you guys discover, the opcodes for the relative jump is EB, one byte offset. So let's try to do that. Okay, so that's 24. Would that be enough? Put it guessing a little bit here. This is a kind of a stab in the dark by me because I'm just trying to guess uh, where to correctly place the um, relative jump in my payload. I might actually be returning um, here, in which case I'd miss it. Or maybe jump forward 10 is still not going to jump me past those bad bytes, but we're just going to try that one and see if it works or not. <coughs> So we'll do this in the debugger just so we can see what's happening. Okay. So at this point, um, the global offset table should have been overwritten, and my um, shell code should have bad bytes in it as well. So let's just look at those bad bytes to see if my jump is going to clear those and if we're even going to hit the jump. So if I recall correctly, I set my return address equal to A030. So I'm just going to look in that ballpark. I'll do 20 just so we have some uh, stuff leading up to it. Okay, so right at 30, I guess very well. 
this is where the stuff was returning to. It looks like I'd be returning right to my jump, but let's see if I jumped far enough away to get past the bad bytes. It, as it is right now, we would jump to 4A042, so as long as this is beyond the bad bytes, I'll be all safe. And it looks like I should be safe, right? This 4 2 is um, down here. So let's see and see what happens. Yay. Say it. Yeah, you made us say it. I'm the leg god. Hear my call. <laughs> okay, so um, did that process kind of make sense? That turned out to be better than I hoped it would be since I um, obviously made a couple other mistakes before I got to this. Uh, did the debugging process make sense a little bit for you guys? Mike, Mike? Yeah, that yeah, was great. Help a little bit? Yeah. So we still have uh, a couple people or a few people really working on it. So I want to give you guys a little bit more time on that since it's an important lab. For you others that have already had success, what can I dream up for you? Okay. For you other guys, Working on this one. Frame pointer overwrite. 